At the end of March in Memphis, Tennessee, garbage workers who were mostly black and grossly underpaid were out on strike. The Kerner Commission had just released its famous report, warning our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. These men who were really at the low rung on the, on the totem pole just got tired of being treated less than men. And if you notice that sign they had, it didn't say peace, it didn't say freedom, it didn't say justice. All it said was, I am a man. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Martin Luther King, the nation's preeminent civil rights leader, came to Memphis to express moral support for the men on strike. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. On March 28th, the Memphis police were out in force. About 12,000 demonstrators gathered to march down Beale Street in support of the garbage workers. King was planning to lead a poor people's march on Washington that summer, an ambitious new campaign focusing on economic justice. Memphis was supposed to be the dry run. There was a group of young guys called the Invaders, some of whom were on the FBI's payroll. We didn't know that at the time. But they were there really to stir up trouble. These young guys had taken the sticks off of the placards, started breaking out windows, and they started the riot. And you know, once you start, everybody gets in it. And rather than try and isolate the people who were rioting, the police just waded into the crowd, just beating people indiscriminately, just, just, just beating them. It was, it was, it was horrible. Martin was taken up physically, put in a car, and taken to the closest hotel for his own safety. And he said, we've got to have a peaceful march. If we don't do it here, we can't go to Washington. King was despondent. Others were losing faith in his nonviolent philosophy. Maybe his time was past. Martin Luther King was at a crossroads. Despite doubts, despite death threats, he refused to turn back. On the night of April 3rd, he appeared before a packed congregation at Mason Temple. It was thundering and lightning, and the rain was coming hard. And, he, and Martin didn't take a text. We called it the mountaintop speech. He just started speaking extemporaneously. And I'd not heard him. Of all the speeches I'd heard, times I'd heard him speak, I'd not heard him like this. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I feel that he was going through a purging of his fear that I no longer fear death. He always said he would not live to be 40. He didn't think he would. He wanted to, but he never thought he'd live to be 40 years old. He was 39 when he was killed. The next day, meeting with aides at his motel, King seemed rejuvenated. As evening approached, he stepped out on the balcony to talk with Jesse Jackson and others. And we're on our way to Reverend Billy Kyle's home for dinner. And I remember we had our, 
our little band there from Chicago, Ben Branch and some musicians, and we were going to have a big rally at Mason Temple that night after dinner. So I was coming across the courtyard, and he said, yes, we're late for dinner. I said, Doc, I've been waiting for you. He said, but you don't have your tie on. I said, well, Doc, you know a tie is not a prerequisite for dinner, just an appetite. He said, boy, you're crazy. Then he said to Ben, said, play my favorite song tonight for me. Precious Lord, Ben said, I will. And I said, Doc, he said, yes. And he said, yes, the bullet hit right here. And they just knocked him back against the wall, and it was over. Police were coming toward us with drawn guns. We were saying, the, the, gun, the bullet came from that way. It couldn't have come from this way. So why are you coming toward us with drawn guns? It came from that way. It came from that way. In black communities across the country, the reaction to King's assassination was a violent eruption of rage and despair. Rioting broke out in more than 100 cities. 20,000 army regulars and 34,000 National Guardsmen were mobilized. In Chicago, Mayor Richard Daley ordered police to shoot to kill. Nationwide, 46 people died. Martin Luther King was dead. America was burning. Many feared that the last hope for racial equality and nonviolence had been extinguished. This seemed like uh, the definitive statement. You know, America tried to redeem itself, and now you know they've killed the man who was taking us to the mountain. You know, even though we ex expected it, when it happened, you know, you, it's, you, you didn't know what to do. And we stayed in shock for a very long time, a very long time. At this point, I had been so knocked out of my middle class assumptions that I didn't know what would happen. Perhaps the country could be reformed and Robert Kennedy would be present, president, perhaps we'd be plunged into a civil war, I'd be imprisoned and killed. Anything was, it was, it was, it seemed, impossible to tell what country we were in and what what was about to happen presenting history's best on PBS <laughs>